All right, well, thanks for coming out. Um, I'm Sarah Gaitis from the Alaska Fisheries Science Center, and I'm gonna give you the first part of the talk. And just by way of introduction, what we plan to do here tonight is talk about marine ecosystems from Alaska to Puget Sound, as the title says. Uh, we're gonna give you some background on each of the areas. So each of our talks is structured kind of similarly. Um, we'll start with some background on the area, then we'll talk about the food web research that we do, and then we'll talk a little bit about how we expect it to be applied. So it's the science and what we're doing with it. Um, and that's the main point, and maybe keep in the back of your head, like if you're the manager or you're the person who receives this information, how are you gonna use it? What are you gonna do with it? And what kind of further questions would you wanna ask? So. That's what we'd like to hear anyway. That would help us with our jobs quite a bit. So if you want to do that, that would be great. Um, so I'm just going to jump right into Alaska here. And also, um, stop me with uh, questions of clarification. If I said something, a word that you don't understand, it's because I use it all the time, but nobody else in the world does. So please stop me and ask what it is, and I'll explain it. So I'm going to try not to do that, but you never know. So first, um, we have the fishery management areas in Alaska here. and. Maybe I will use this. Yeah. So Alaska is a big chunk of real estate. You guys probably all already know that. How many have been to Alaska? Oh yeah, lots of people have been to Alaska here. So um, what, where we work is everywhere from the Gulf of Alaska through the Aleutian Islands up into the Bering Sea. And then more recently, we've been developing some stuff for the Arctic. And the fishery management areas here are very big. Um, we'll go into exact square kilometers later, but you can pretty much fit the east coast of the US and the Gulf of Alaska there. You can put at least one California on the Bering Sea shelf. This is a lot of area that we deal with. And our, our center specifically looks at the federal fisheries in this area. So I'll give you some more details on that too. And the other thing for you to keep in mind is I will be using acronyms because I am a federal employee. and so. This is EBS, always means Eastern Bering Sea. AI means Aleutian Islands. GOA means Gulf of Alaska. I'm going to try and avoid that, but it slips into my slides, and I don't even see them anymore. So like I said, if I haven't defined an acronym, please stop me. So those are the big management areas that we have in Alaska. And in Alaska, we have some rather large fisheries. Um, by volume and value, these are some of the biggest fisheries in the United States. The figure changes from year to year, but it's a very large proportion. And so what I'm showing here is last year's catches in metric tons of several of our major species. And I'm just gonna go over what some of the species are so you can get some idea of what the fish are. A lot of these fish are down here in Puget Sound too. So there'll be some familiar species. So right here, that's the Alaska Pollock. How many have eaten Pollock? Okay, yeah, you guys, have, you guys know more than the typical audience because you probably know that Pollock is Mrs. Paul's fish sticks and a lot of the fish fillets at McDonald's and also the, the K-Rab that is the artificial crab used in, in sushi. So this is a, a really big fishery. This fish right here is generally caught on really big boats like that and if you drive around in daylight around to Pier 91 you'll probably see this boat um, and others like it in the fleet. They're 300 plus foot factory trawlers. So I want to give you some idea of the fish and the fisheries. And a lot of these boats are based here in Seattle. So this, these fisheries are far away, but a lot of the economy is connected here. Anybody have a job related to fishing? Yeah, okay. And us. All right. Um, so again, I'll try and give you some background on what the both the ecology and the economy is like up here around these fisheries. So that's the Alaska Pollock, and that's some of the big um, trawlers that catch them. Also, we have some flatfish is the next most abundant catch, and there's a rock sole. A lot of these fish are caught and go to Asia, Asian markets. That's the arrowtooth flounder, a, a lovely species that is um, a really important predator in a lot of these ecosystems, but it's not such an important commercial fish. So we don't necessarily catch as many of these as we do of other things, and that can set up some interesting dynamics. And there's a slightly smaller trawler. This one you could probably see over uh, towards Fisherman's Terminal. That uh, we call this the head and gut fleet, affectionately, because they catch these fish and they head them and gut them and send them off to Asia. Um, Pacific cod are also caught on these trawlers, but they're caught on long liners and with um, pots as well. So they have really diverse gear types that are used in this fishery. And there's a Pacific cod. That's the next most important species by volume. And then we have a bunch of other fish that I'll show you on the next slide. But the only other point I want to make here is that's Alaska total catches. Ground fish, there's some jargon I didn't explain. Anybody know what a ground fish is? 
Yeah, it's, it's a funny fish term that basically means fish that are not up in the water column. They tend to hang around towards the bottom, probably comes from New England. I don't even know what the origin of the term ground fish is. But they're the fish on the grounds, I think is what it comes from. It's, so it's a lot of fish that hang around near the bottom or maybe at the bottom. So these are the ground fish catches, and that's to distinguish it from things like herring and salmon, which are not ground fish, okay? Most of this catch is caught in the Eastern Bering Sea, but a lot of it still comes from the Gulf of Alaska and Aleutian Islands. Now, this fishery is worth some money. Um, and last year, the value of the fishery actually dropped. So this is a lower number than I would have showed last year. Um, and a lot of that comes from Pollock, but so what I'm showing here are the total amounts, X vessel value before processing. This is what the, sort of what the fishermen make. And so in pink are the things that we don't consider ground fish but are still part of the Alaska fishery and in black are the things that we do consider ground fish and that my agency manages more directly. We have some input into some of these other things but they're generally managed by the state of Alaska or other things. So this is quite a bit of money and Pollock used to be ahead of salmon. They're always in a race every year and this year Pollock was a little bit less. That's because there was actually less pollock catch in 2009. And this is something that's kind of important to the Seattle area. Like I said, there's a lot of vessels docked around here that fish in this fishery, and so this made the news two years ago when the pollock population was declining and when there had to be less catch than people had had before. And that's the Seattle Times from October. These, this news comes right out of the meetings where our science is discussed. So a lot of us were at this meeting, and this is, this is big news around here. Now, things change, of course, fairly quickly in the fisheries world, and so this year the news looks a lot better for Pollock. And I'm going to show you some of the story around this from a, more of an ecosystem perspective, because this is based on the single species perspective of we look at this particular stock of fish and we see what they're doing, and I'll explain that process a little bit more too. So the news is pretty good for Pollock, especially with respect to the fisheries in Seattle. Um, there's some other news, though, that's not maybe so good for the fisheries in Seattle, and it also has to do with the ecosystem, and that's maybe you guys have heard of the stellar sea lion? Anyone? Yeah, okay, this is an endangered species um, in Alaska that has been monitored pretty closely since it was declared endangered about a decade ago, and there is one part of the population that is still not recovering, and so there may be additional restrictions placed on the fisheries in the Aleutian Islands, in particular a fishery for Adka mackerel, which is mostly a Seattle-based fleet, so yes? What is their primary uh, food source? That's an excellent question. The primary food source for these guys does happen to be several of the fish that we catch in the commercial fishery. So it's Atka mackerel, it's cod, it's pollock. It's also salmon. It's also a bunch of other things. And there's some question about when and how much food they need and who else is competing with it. But yes, so there's the potential for there to be an interaction here, and that's why there ha may have to be additional fisheries closures. So yeah, very perceptive question on the ecosystem there. And that's exactly what we're trying to get at, is how do we get some of these ecosystem indicators and some of these ecosystem information into the fishery management process. So just to explain what that process is really quickly so you understand, in Alaska, the management is really based on science. It's not this way everywhere, but in Alaska there's a really long tradition of having the scientists look at the information. We collect a lot of data. This little green bubble up here, data collection, is a lot of what the Alaska Fisheries Science Center does. There's a lot of surveys, and I'll show you some pictures from those so you can get an idea of what that looks like and how we learn about the environment. There's just a lot of information collected. And that all goes into what we call a stock assessment, and it's not Wall Street, it's a fish stock. And so, but it's kind of the same idea, and it's a lot of the same math, if you're interested in that sort of thing. I could give you details later, but the models that people use for stock assessment just assess how is the population doing and how much more can we expect to be able to take next year, or should we take less. That information goes through an extensive scientific and public review process, and this happens every year. Um, and then finally, next year's catch limit comes out of the review process. That is happening this week in Anchorage, right now, for next year's fisheries. So I don't have all the answers for what's going to happen next year yet, but if you wait till the end of the week, you can find out. This happens for about 40 individual species every single year. And the question is, 
how does some of this ecosystem stuff feed in here? So how would a food web or some other information like on stellar sea lions or something we're not fishing for make it into this process? And that's where our work comes in. So I'm just going to try to describe a little background on what we're trying to do here. So in this plot, I'm showing a conceptual model for the production of a given fish. So how much is it expected to grow every year? And it's basically, there's inputs to production and there's outputs from production and you try, to, you try to total up everything in a balance. If any economists in the audience? It's called an input-output model. If you're an economist, it's exactly the same math. So basically, if, if you think of even yourself, you have to eat things and you're gonna have some energy loss due to respiration in your energy budget. You're gonna have some energy loss because you will ingest some things or if you're training a two-year-old, you poop. That's how I talk to my daughter. Um, and then, but you're also gonna be able to grow, okay? And so some of that growth is gonna go to fisheries, some of it is gonna get eaten by predators, and some of it's gonna die for unknown reasons, and then what's left over goes into the detritus pool. Detritus is just where everything winds up and gets recycled into the ecosystem. So standard, I think, single species assessment look very much at this interaction right here between production and the fisheries. And that's the focus of it, because the fishery is expected to have a lot of effect on production. What we're trying to do is bring a lot of this other stuff into the picture at the same time. So to do that, we build models. And I'm going through all this detail so Chris doesn't have to, because he does the same stuff I do. So it's the same model, so just remember this when you can hear all the cool applications that he's doing. Um, so to build a mathematical model of an energy budget or a food web, same thing, we need information on several, several sort of parameters for each population here. We need to know the biomass. How much does the whole population of something weigh? So think of a single fish population first. We need to know its population growth rate. I think everybody understands what that is because it's just like the human population growth rate. We need to know how much is caught. We need to know its consumption rate. How much as a population does it need to eat every year? And we need to know what its diet is. What does it eat? Okay, we need this for every single group in the ecosystem. So over here in this plot, I'm showing you Trophic level is a way that we, it, you've probably heard of apex predators or high trophic level or low trophic level. That's just a way of saying, so the shark is the apex predator. It, it eats other fish. If a cow is a very low trophic level animal because it eats directly on plants, right? So you have your plants in the ocean, which are phytoplankton, tiny little microscopic creatures floating around out there. And then you have your zooplankton, which are your tiny little microscopic animal creatures that eat the plants. So out in the ocean, it's basically, you know, the, the fields are microscopic plants, and then the cows are microscopic animals, okay? And then, then you start to get to see actual larger things. It's sort of the opposite of a land-based food web where all the big things are the plants, right? So you get into something we call forage fish, and we call them that because we like to eat them and marine mammals like to eat them. And you get juvenile and adult ground fish. There's that term again. And so you can have as many things as you want in this food web, and you'll see some particularly ugly detailed examples later from both of us. Um, but the idea here is we can we c the size of this box is related to the biomass of the whole population, and the size of this arrow, or the width of the arrow, is related to the flows. Okay, so how much does it consume, and how much of its production is consumed at the next level up? And we put this whole thing together to try to say, okay, if this fishery takes some of this, um, do we need, is, is there going to be more of this, for example? So where are the, if we redirect the energy in the food web, where's it going to go and what's going to happen to the other things in the food web? That's the main idea here. So where do we get all this information? This is the ocean. We can't just walk out there and start measuring things. We need to go to some great lengths to figure this stuff out. So fortunately, we already do all those stock assessments I was telling you about, and we can use a lot of the same information. We have uh, trawl surveys where we can go and get our biomass or abundance, and I'll show you a bunch of pictures of how we do that, just to give you an example. And then we have fishery observers. In Alaska, we have one of the biggest observer programs in the country, maybe in the world, um, where quite a few of these fishing vessels carry a, an observer that's trained by federal scientists, and this poor guy has to go out here in the catch with his little basket and come back up with a scientific sample of what is in this trawl alley right here. That's a cod catch. It's really mixed, and it's 
it's very difficult to sample. There's all these different methods for doing it. We give people all this special equipment, and basically all of this information comes back to us. So we know what's caught, not just the things we meant to catch, but everything that's caught. And we total it all up, and it all goes into the management system. So I think I forgot to mention. What's that? Is there a question? Sorry. That's, that's a really good question. The question, sorry I didn't see you back there. I didn't even, <laughs> the, the question was, is the observer employed by the agency or are they employed some other way? And it's pretty complicated and I think it's about to change in Alaska, but the current system is that they're trained by the agency, but they're contractors that are hired through an independent contractor that the fishing boats actually hire them through the contractor. So there's, potential for conflict of interest, but the training and the debriefing and all the data comes back to us, and so they look really hard at that stuff. But I think it's about to change, because they just came up with a new thing they call the service delivery model, and all just went through the North Pacific Council. I can give you details on that if you want. Um, yeah, it's probably too much information. But basically, the good news is we have a lot more information on what's actually caught in these fisheries than a lot of places. And then finally, while we're out on these surveys, we cut open a bunch of fish and look in their stomachs, which is pretty graphic. Sorry, I know you're eating. Um, that's, that's what's left of a pollock right there, and that's an arrowtooth flounder. And so as you can see, there were two of these pollock in this one arrowtooth flounder. Um, and the pollock is almost as big as the arrowtooth flounder. So fish are not limited by things like, you know, if you or me, we couldn't eat something two-thirds our own size, not all at once. Um, fish don't have that problem. So you get some pretty interesting dynamics out there. So uh, let me give you an example of what we do on the trawl surveys, just because, you know, you can probably picture walking through the woods and measuring trees and counting birds and stuff like that, but how do we do this in the ocean? We do these trawl surveys, this is, uh, and we do them on chartered fishing vessels in Alaska. And so that's the Vesterallen, and this, I think, is the Northwest Explorer. Um, I've been on both of these boats, and they're usually Pollock boats, but they charter in the summer, and they go out, and they do these surveys for us. So it's a fisherman running the boat, but the scientists tell them where to go, and the scientists sort through the catch and everything. There's the net going out in a very beautiful, calm bay, which is completely representative of all the conditions in Alaska that we've ever encountered. And this is what the net looks like. Um, so if, if you're a fish, this gives you some idea of what's coming at you. And this looks pretty big compared to the people there, but um, it's actually a tiny little toy net compared to what they use in the commercial fisheries, and the fishermen tell us that all the time when we're out there doing the trawling. And so here's what the fish might look like in one of their habitats. So that's a cod, and Rebecca assures me that this is a POP, um, although I couldn't identify it from the picture myself. I have to admit I'm a modeler, okay? <laughs> Pacific Ocean Perch, thank you, Chris. That was an acronym, but he knew what it was. Okay, and so this is what they might look like in their natural habitat, and you can see them associated with all of the invertebrates and stuff there. But this is what they look like to us. They come up in the trawl net, and they get dumped on a table, and we sort through this catch, and we sort it to species, and we measure and weigh everything, and we take some samples from a lot of the fish to figure out how old they are, and we take their stomachs. And so maybe you can see there's a halibut right there, and that's an arrow flounder and that's a pollock. So we go through that whole catch and we do this, I don't know, in the Gulf of Alaska maybe 800 times in a summer and in the Bering Sea some more. So that gives you an idea of, so if, if you were a terrestrial biologist, it's sort of like being in a bulldozer and driving it up the mountain and sorting through the rubble at the top. That's how we do our sampling, okay? But this is a pretty good way of learning about a system that you can't occupy, yeah. That's a good question too. So how does the trawling affect the ocean floor? We only put the trawl down where it's not gonna get stuck. And so we search for a fairly flat bottom that doesn't have a lot of relief and doesn't have a lot of things like corals and other fragile animals on it. So we're hoping that when we drag the bottom with this trawl net, it's not doing any more harm than, it, you know, it's, it recovers fairly quickly and the invertebrates and stuff go back over and they may survive. So, but yeah, we can't put the net down anywhere where there's high relief, so we try to avoid that. Yeah. And everybody always asks, what do we do with the fish after that? Well, the halibut we might eat, um, and some of the fish we'll keep, but it, for various reasons it can't be retained and it can't be sold, and so it goes back over, yeah. You know, in some experiments, the bottom is monitored after trawling, and we have an expert at the center who does a lot of work on the effects of trawl on bottom habitat, and I 
wish I could answer that question for you, but he would be the guy to ask. I'd be happy to put you in touch with him. He's done extensive work on that, and it varies by habitat. Some habitats, you can't even tell it went over. Others, yeah, it does some damage. So, yeah. Are you finding that what you catch is representative of what's left? What do you mean? of what's in the ocean. That's what we hope, that is the assumption. There are, different animals are susceptible to the net in different ways, and so people do a lot of research on that too. Like some things run away from a net and some things swim into it. And so we try to adjust for that, and in the stock assessments they try to adjust for that. But the answer is, this is not perfect knowledge right here. There's a lot of uncertainty. So the assumption is, yeah, we're representing what's there, but we know that that has varying degrees <laughs> of being accurate. So what do we do with all this information? We build one of those food web models and then we show it to people and they understand it instantly. Um, this is the food web of the Gulf of Alaska. Re re simplified. And that's not really a joke, actually. If you look, there's a whole big box called bivalves. How many people can think of like 10 different kinds of clams? maybe a hundred different kinds of clams. That's what's in there. How many people can think of, maybe you don't know what euphousids is, they're krill, okay? There's a lot of those. Copepods is another, zooplankton. There's a whole bunch of species down here. But the complexity is definitely up here because what do we care about? We're a fisheries agency, we care about the fish, so we've tried to make sure every single one of our important target species is represented in here. That's why it looks like that. But really, we do, we, I show this as a joke, as simplified, but it, this is not useful to the fisheries management council necessarily in and of itself. So in the last minute I've got here, I'm just going to show you what we have done with it and then turn you over to Chris for some more stuff. So if you're interested, there's a lot of initiatives on ecosystem-based fishery management in Alaska, and if you don't have time to jot these down, I'm happy to get you these websites later, but they're things that I've been involved in and my group has been involved in. And I'm just going to focus on this last one, which is a report that we deliver along with that annual fishery management process every year. And this year, we tried to revamp it to make a clearer story of what's going on in the Bering Sea ecosystem. So I'm just going to show you how the food web model feeds into that really quickly. So here's the big ugly food web model, right? But the thing is, not everything in here is, is unique, okay? So what we can do is take some of these species, and that's just a diagram showing some similarity of diets of a whole bunch of species in this food web. So each one of these little lines here is a species name, but you don't really need to worry about what they are. What I'm showing here are diet compositions, and each color is a type of prey. And so what you can see is they group out the diet composition so that this group has a set of prey the blue and the purple and the yellow, that's more similar in itself than it is to this group up here that's eating a whole bunch of totally different stuff. Using that type of analysis, we can group these things into what we call feeding guilds, okay? So now we've taken this food web and made it into this food web. We haven't actually lost any data, we're just showing it differently. And so now we have things like apex predators, there's that term again, of the things like sharks are in there. Pelagic foragers, pelagic is just open water, so things like pollock are in there. Benthic foragers, that's just the bottom, so that's all your flatfish and stuff like that. And then a bunch of invertebrates and stuff, and it's still basically the same thing, but easier on the human eye, yeah. <laughs> Predictions, what do we use? Okay, so I'm gonna show you a little bit of that, but that's a really good discussion question if you wanna come back around, because I don't have time to do that to let Chris talk, but we, we should come back to that one. So um, here's what we do with the foraging guilds. Now we can take our apex predators and pelagic foragers guilds and just show them all stacked here. So there's arrowtooth flounder going up like crazy in the Gulf of Alaska, eating lots and lots of pollock in green here, which happen to be going down. And so you can start to see that there might be different trends of the species, but in the guild as a whole, there's also a trend. And this is what we try to show to the managers. We can take this line and just draw it just like this and say our whole apex predators guild has been increasing in the Gulf of Alaska since 1977 here to 2009, whereas pelagic foragers have been decreasing. These guys eat these guys, so maybe you can see that there's going to be a little bit of a, something's got to give at some point here, right? And so these last symbols are just part of our what we show to the scientific review panel, but basically the plus means this thing is higher than we've really seen it 
in the last five years here, which is the green box relative to the whole thing. And this just means, well, it's basically in the green box still. So we just want to be able to tell them it's higher than we've seen, it's lower than we've seen, just to give them an idea. And this year, you're not meant to be able to read this, but the pink boxes show where the food web model contributed to the whole report card for the Eastern Bering Sea, EBS. And it's, it, the whole report is available here, and it's publicly available if people are interested in the types of work that we're trying to bring into the fishery management process from an ecosystem perspective. But in my last slide here, I'm just going to walk you through this pointy-headed, scientific-looking thing and tell you what the story actually is out of this, and then I'm going to hand it over to Chris. So we went through, and we have, like, I don't know, 200 things we could be looking at in the ecosystem, maybe more. And we used to just present all of that. And of course, people thought, said, OK, that's too much, and we can't deal with this. So could you please just you know, synthesize? And so this year, that's what we really tried to do. And we got down to 10 things that we thought it was important to look at. And they go from an atmospheric index on the bottom to a fishing index on the top and everything in between. And we try to cover all those trophic levels, but really summarize. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit of the story here, because it actually turned out to be pretty interesting. Um, from You can't read the top here, but this is 1999, this line right here, and this is 2010, and this green box is just the last five years. And so um, down here, this index, second from the bottom, is called the Ice Retreat Index. It's an index of how long ice stays on the Bering Sea Shelf. That's this picture here. And you'll see in the first half of the 2000s, it, it, there wasn't any ice on the Bering Sea Shelf in the spring, and lately there has been. And this is really different than what it's been like before. So we had like this whole string of years with no ice, really warm, and then a whole string with better ice. And it really changed the way the zooplankton were. So we had this all-time low of zooplankton that we measured, and then they suddenly go up through the roof with the ice. So there's a zooplankton there going up. Pollock like this, because Pollock eats zooplankton. Thick-billed mirrors like this, that's a seabird in the Bering Sea, because they also like zooplankton. So their reproductive success was going down and is now going up. And Pollock had been going down and we're at a historic low, but are now kind of turning around. So this is part of the ecosystem level story we're trying to tell. And this isn't prediction. This is just the information we have right now. But it, we're hoping it feeds into the management process in a way that helps people decide what should the Pollock quota be, for instance. Now, the news isn't all good. Um, this downtrending line here is northern fur seal pups that are born in the Pribilof Islands in the Eastern Bering Sea. And they have been going down for a really long time. They eat pollock, and so maybe this is going to help them, but we don't know yet, and that's something we need to really watch because, of course, pinnipeds are something that can close a fishery. And then finally, our predators here, they both eat pollock. They're both going up, so that might start looking more like the gulf too. So I just want to leave you with a question for discussion, both on the prediction, but if you were the Fishery Management Council and you're just used to looking at single species by single species, what are you going to do with this information now? How would this help you make any decisions? Okay, and with that... I'm going to turn it over to Chris. Sorry. Thanks, Sarah. So we're going to change locations and scales quite a bit uh, now as we go to Puget Sound. Um, the slide I have here is mainly to demonstrate, first of all, as we talk about Puget Sound, we're going to be talking about a system that's spatially quite complicated, maybe compared to some of those big open ocean systems that Sarah was talking about. There you can see this should look fairly familiar. Uh, lots of little nooks and crannies uh, all throughout Puget Sound. Puget Sound is divided into several small sub-basins that are separated from one another by islands in the mainland and also uh, have depending on where you are, some important rivers flowing into them and uh, a lot of people living right adjacent to them. So as we go into Puget Sound, we're going to be talking about a very different set of conditions than Sarah was talking about in a, a big open ocean system that's dominated uh, as far as human impacts go by fishing. And just to illustrate that a little further with some, some statistics here, you can see as we look at Alaska compared to Puget Sound, we're talking about in Puget Sound, uh, an extremely uh, much, much smaller uh, area of, of marine, uh, w of, of water, of surface water, uh, and a much larger population, basically about uh, 10 times as many people in a much, much, much smaller area than is in Alaska. And so if you put a lot more people much closer to the water, you're probably going to end up with a, a lot of human 
effects on that system, and they're probably going to be a little different than just fishing, too. Uh, to underscore that point, uh, fishing is quite a bit less uh, valuable in Puget Sound than it is in Alaska, and of the value that is attributed to fishing, most of that is recreational fishing. So a lot of that isn't about fish coming out of the water. It's about someone filling the cooler before they go buy their fishing license and their bait before they go pay for a, uh, a slot at the, at the boat launch. So there's an awful lot of money in there that has nothing to do with a fish actually coming out of the water. So basically that's the point that I'd like to make is uh, whereas Sarah was looking a lot uh, more at fishing effects, we're going to have a quite quite a bit more diverse set of threats or effects in Puget Sound than, than maybe we'd see in open Alaskan waters. And if you think about it as if, uh, let's just assume that we have a hypothetical marine ecosystem here represented uh, by this body of water, uh, the goals that uh, society uh, living in and around that water, well not in the water, but around, <laughs> around the water body uh, might have are going to be quite variable. You know, depending on who you are, you might think of it as a source of revenue, as a nice place to live, as a fun place to go outing of some kind, as a source of fish, or as this, uh, this place with beautiful wildlife in it. And depending on how you, uh, where your goals are, you're going to see that same hypothetical ecosystem very differently. You could see it as this mosaic of beautiful habitats and wonderful species. You could see it as a source of income, uh, or you could see it as, uh, well, you might e not even notice it so much as just take advantage of some utility that it provides, like say someone who, uh, who, who lives in this area, maybe they don't have to control their wastewater as much as someone living in a more landlocked area might because uh, there's this nice handy uh, source of dilution right downstream from you, so maybe maybe water treatment isn't quite as robust as it would be somewhere like in, uh, I don't know, in the desert or in the Midwest or somewhere like that. So just depending on who you are, you're going to have different goals, and a lot of times those goals are going to be different depending on which way you see the ecosystem, and there's going to be trade-offs between those, uh, those different sets of goals. And that's what ecosystem management really is all about, is making sure that those trade-offs are addressed in a way that some people don't get a raw deal and, uh, and that the resources out here can be sustained as much as possible. But question mark, question mark, question mark, what does that actually look like? And that's really what a lot of our science is done to support. Around here, the Puget Sound Partnership uh, is the state agency that's in charge of really deciding what the priorities are and how some of those trade-offs are going to be managed. And this all started this is just a few years ago when the Puget Sound Partnership was created by Governor Gregoire. And the Puget Sound Partnership's first goal was to basically just go out into the public uh, with uh, lots of town hall meetings and uh, public comment periods and, and so forth s to solicit opinions about what people think a healthy Puget Sound looks like, uh, what Puget Sound is, the status of Puget Sound right now, what the biggest threats are, what we need to do to make it healthy by 2020, uh, because that's clear vision in 2020, and how do we start uh, getting there. Uh, so this scoping project was basically uh, an effort to get people on the same page and get people talking about what their priorities are. And the priorities had to do with things like human health and water quality and the wa water quantity, you know, how much snowpack is in the mountains, and restoring things like killer whales and salmon. They didn't have an awful lot to do with fishing, which again sets this apart from the Alaska condition. But again, this is a really difficult thing, all these diverse goals. And so again, how do we make sense of all this? And that's where the same kind of science that Sarah talked about comes into the work that, that I do. And I'm going to focus a little bit more on the same kind of model. Mine's complicated. It's not as complicated as, as Sarah's was. Uh, but uh, I'd like you to think about this uh, as just a depiction of uh, an extraordinarily boring video game uh, that if you bought a video game like this for your kids for Christmas or uh, well, they would run away or <laughs> something something awful. Uh, and But we use this very boring video game, as Sarah was demonstrating, to simulate conditions based on what we think we know and ask questions that are important. And some of the questions that I'm trying to ask that uh, address these trade-offs are, uh, are what I'm going to talk to you about uh, just in the balance of my presentation. Uh, so the first one 
is are there canaries in the coal mine, which, as if to, which is to say, are there indicator species? So when you think about all those trade-offs that I showed in the, the sort of the, the cartoon diagram of the hypothetical system, basically we can't go out and measure everything, especially in, uh, in the case of Puget Sound where research budgets are quite a bit smaller than, than in Alaska and uh, the state uh, of Washington is really struggling to keep up with monitoring just because budgets are so tight. So are there some species that we can look at that are those canaries in the coal mine that, that track the condition of the ecosystem and let us know what a lot of the other species are doing? The Puget Sound Partnership identified these four uh, species or species groups as the most important indicator species, the likeliest canaries in the coal mine that would tell us what the health of Puget Sound is doing. Phytoplankton, jellyfish, wild salmon and uh, southern resident killer whales or orcas. So how do those groups do? So I ran my vi really boring video game model. All these little squiggly lines, each one of them is one group of the 60 or so in my model. And basically this is just, if you think about this horizontal line here, if they're going above it, their, their biomass is increasing. If they're going below it, it's decreasing. So I ran a 50-year simulation, just a fake simulation where I just threw random uh, environmental variation in the production of the phytoplankton. And my only question here was, well, how do these four indicators, how well do they predict all the squiggle in, in the other groups? How well do they uh, relate to everything else? So this is just an example with salmon. Salmon some of the time does pretty well. It, it, it tracks the biomass of some of these other uh, diving birds, lingcod, and starfish pretty well. But in other cases, it doesn't do that well at all. You can see there's a lot of splatter around the, the central blue line, which represents the salmon. Not, not a really good tracker of all of them. And in fact, when you compare or when you just total all four of these high priority indicators, are they good canaries in the coal mine? Well, they get about 50% of the food web right. So what we were able to do was just ask, well, what else can we add in to bring that number up a little bit? And we found that when we added juvenile rockfish, harbor seals, dungeness crab, and herring in, we were able to get more like 80% of the food web reasonably right. Uh, so that's helping us figure out who the most important species are to measure so that we know in general what's going on. The question was why those four were chosen. Those were chosen based mainly on public sentiment and expert opinion uh, about what we think probably tracks the rest of the system best based on what we know now. And that one was the source of quite a bit of debate and consternation. And uh, and yeah, there there are there are people that are angry at other people that that one was chosen instead of herring. So so this isn't easy at all. Are herring more environment? Are jellyfish more environmentally sensitive than herring? Uh, yes, I would say they are. But just because they're more envir environmentally s uh, sensitive doesn't mean that they're good predictors because they could just be, you know changing every time the wind blows, which most species probably don't, especially the ones we care about. So how about what the role of habitat is? Uh, the habitat that I chose to do some modeling work on is eelgrass, which you see when you drive uh, along Puget Sound, you see green patches out in the, in the mud flats. That's eelgrass, which is good habitat for salmon and uh, juvenile crabs, and it's also important spawning habitat for herring. So this is a way of showing some data here where this is a model I ran where uh, I'm just summarizing the biomasses of some of these different groups uh, and also the amount of fishing, sport fishing and commercial fishing. And this uh, sort of ugly orange, I think that's a, a heptagon, I think a heptagon. <laughs> uh, I haven't said heptagon since fourth grade. Uh, this represents just stable what's going on right now. So when we reduce eelgrass by 50%, things that move toward the middle of the diagram are actually decreasing in biomass. So when you decrease eelgrass cover, you lose some herring, you lose a lot of wild salmon, and you lose a little bit of Dungeness crab, and also the value of your fishing. But marine mammals and species of concern, like in threatened species, don't seem to change too much. When you increase eelgrass, you get a big bump in some of these same species and, uh, that were going down before, but again, not much of a change in these, in these other groups. So this is, just, this is just a simulation, but this gives us some idea of how we might expect the food web to change based on what we think we know if there's a change in eelgrass, except for things like salmon that you're not going to catch when you're catching some of those others. So that's why fishing probably isn't as important as, as it is elsewhere. Are, are we good? Okay. 
So another question, are there species with disproportionate effects on the food web, which uh, we give the nickname of keystone species? And the one that I am looking at right now I'm interested in is bald eagles, which their numbers are absolutely booming in Puget Sound area right now. If you look at this uh, map of where bald eagle nests are in 1980, same uh, statistic in 2005, but you can see their numbers have just gone up exponentially, and these are just the ones that live in the Puget Sound area for most of the year that they nest here. You also get big populations that come down from Canada and Alaska to overwinter in this area and to eat uh, salmon. And because of improvements in pesticide use, bald eagle numbers have really, really ramped up. And obviously these are big birds that are hungry and they eat other things that are hungry too. So since they're up at the top of the, of, of the food chain, we would expect them to have some impacts uh, on the things that they eat and, and down the line a little bit. So here's another silly video game that I played uh, where this red line here indi uh, indicates that right around this point of a model run, if you assume that time is on the axis here, uh, I cl clobbered the biomass of bald eagles early in this model just to see what would happen. These are the things that they eat. These are all birds. Uh, among other things that they eat, they eat a lot of birds. And you can see that just as the bald eagle biomass goes crashing down, the biomass of a lot of these other birds starts to go up. And the things that they eat, which tend to be small fish, for the most part start to go down after uh, a few years. Uh, and the things that the fish eat, uh, some of them don't really change that much just because they are productive enough that they don't really notice what's going on above them. But some other things like uh, some of the shrimp that's w that live up in the water column and that live down near the bottom actually do respond positively somewhat. We call this a trophic cascade when you see impacts just going down a food chain like that. Nearshore diving birds tend to eat things like mussels, and you can see that there's an effect on those as well. Uh, herbivorous birds obviously eat things like uh, nearshore plants, and again, they're so productive that they don't really realize or recognize uh, or respond to things that are going on above them. So this suggests that there, in fact, are species up at the top of the food web that can really pack a wallop if they're if their numbers change. So that was all modeling stuff. Um, this is a departure. This is actual field work that I do when I get away from my computer, and we had the preposterous idea this was my preposterous idea that uh, we might want to know what jellyfish are all about, maybe in reference to the earlier question about how important jellyfish are. So this is a species of jellyfish called the lion's mane jelly that becomes pretty abundant in Puget Sound in the, in the summer. We actually took these little tags uh, that are a little bigger than a penny, and this is uh, I took this picture of my colleague uh, Kelly Andrews putting that tag with a cable tie around some connective tissue underneath this jellyfish. Uh, and then these tags give a little ping off every minute and a half or so. These red dots over in Hood Canal represent these little listening stations that can hear the little pings. And the pings give off both the ID, the identification number of the jellyfish. Each one gets its own little serial number. And it also tells us where it is and how deep it is. So ridiculous. Uh, but we learned something from this ridiculous study. These are, the, uh, these are the profiles of a couple of uh, the jellyfish that held onto their tags for a pretty long time. You can see uh, this is depth and this is date uh, for each one of these four individuals. So you can see uh, they're going up and down and up and down and up and down in the water column a lot. Some of them more so than others. The, the bigger ones tend to go deeper than some of the smaller ones. And so this is new information. We had no idea that they were using this much of the water column that much of the time, that they were just banging up and down like that. But we also got some water chemistry data um, from, um, there's some buoys that are out here that monitor water quality constantly. That red line represents the depth at which the water goes too low in oxygen for fish to live in it. And there was a pretty big fish kill actually in Hood Canal this summer. And you can see the jellyfish don't seem to have any problem going down into water that fish can't live in. So th what this tells us, another one of those trade-offs I talked about earlier, water quality becomes important in Puget Sound because when the water quality gets too bad, jellyfish can do just fine, thank you, and maybe the fish can't. And jellyfish actually compete with fish for a lot of food or they eat the fish themselves. So we have to be thinking, like Sarah indicated earlier, we have to be thinking about all these things kind of at the same time, including the way water quality and some of these species interact with one another uh, if we want to uh, manage the system responsibly. There's a question. Yeah. 
Uh, well, uh, there, if, if, they, if they were dead, uh, we had some that died or that shed their tags. And when they shed the tags, the tag goes to a, a pretty deep depth and stays there. The only movement we get in the tag has to do with the tide going up and down because the, the, um, the little pinging detector goes up and down with the tide. So for these to have been bouncing up and down like this, there's no other explanation except that it was the, the jellyfish swimming up and down. But uh, we did we did lose a few jellies, unfortunately. Oh, thanks. Question behind me. Um, uh, how many jellyfish of this species are in Puget Sound? Oh, we only we were only able to tag about twenty because the tags are expensive, so we can only do so much with information like this. And it was also a pretty confined geographic area. Uh, the question was how many jellies we tagged, and we tagged about 20. Um, but um, so this is <laughs> strange use of, of, of taxpayer dollars, perhaps. But <laughs> each, each graph represents one jelly. Yeah, so we have about, uh, about 15 that we got really good data like this from. And so that really brings me to the end of, of my presentation. Uh, again, the, just the idea here that we whether we're in Alaska or in Puget Sound, uh, there are going to be a lot of different societal goals, uh, and hopefully we can use some of these models to help managers address those goals a little bit with a little bit more information behind them. I, uh, I heard the last, like about a year or two ago, there was a lot of conversation about the increased acidity levels in Puget Sound relative to like oyster, um, you know, oyster, juvenile oy oysters, for lack of a better word. And I sort of, that sort of seemed to have gone away, at least in just hearing about it. And I did, I'm just kind of curious what's sort of, what's happened there, what's the current status? Uh, ocean acidification is one of the most active areas of, uh, of research actually right now. And that, that topic will not go away anytime soon. And in fact, there are several people at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center who are very actively doing both field and experimental work to determine the effects of acidification, mainly on crustaceans. Uh, and, uh, and, and so there will be more work on that forthcoming. We, in fact, we just hosted a big conference of NOAA scientists primarily on ocean acidification here in Seattle uh, earlier this year. So there's more to come for sure. So yeah, I was going to ask my question about um, predictions from your photo bombs. If I'm a policymaker, if you're talking to a policymaker about the impact on ocean acidification or on increasing global temperatures or on El Nino or La Nina, what do your food web models predict about these things? What kind of things can you say for a policymaker? <laughs> Thanks. That is an excellent question, and that is the type of information that I think people are looking for from us. And I think when we try to answer this, we try to incorporate the amount of uncertainty that we actually have into our answer. So Chris showed a lot of really good examples of the type of stuff you can do with these models. You can do a lot of simulations, and you can ask a lot of questions like, what if this changed, or what if that happened? And I think they're really good tools for showing sort of the direction that things might go. Um, some of the work that we're doing is actually trying to formally incorporate a little more of the uncertainty because that food web that we show up here, you know, that is dependent on a lot of observations from the system and some of them have uncertainty in it. So we try to um, make as many different food webs as we can within the knowledge that we have and run them all to kind of put bounds on our answers when we start predicting things. and. And we feel more comfortable that way because the single line on the plot, I think we all agree, that's, that's a video game, okay? And, and if people really want answers and we don't know a lot of the processes behind them yet, we want to be very careful about making a prediction that could lead them to make the wrong decision. So, I don't know. That's maybe not completely answering your question, but yeah, it's an I active area of research. Yeah, it, it definitely is, and the onus is on us to get better at predicting, but most of the people that Sarah and I work with who use models like this would say that if we ran a, predict, a predictive or a forecasting model and we saw one of these perturbations that we, you know, we hit the system with a hammer and we see, let's say, uh, stellar sea lions increase by 35%, we would not tell people stellar sea lines are going to increase by 35%. We might say it looks like they are going to increase. 
the managers that are taking that information are weighing it against so many other factors that they might want to maybe change harvest levels slightly or, or maybe to a, a greater degree just based on the information that it appears that there's an effect on sea lions. But, uh, but they would certainly not take any, any forecast that came out of our model and say, this is the answer. And that's the way we tend to regard them too. And I could add that the single species stock assessment models are used for prediction, but basically one year out. <laughs> That's the level of confidence, I think, that we're comfortable with, with a lot of this. Yeah, and you can take, you can take the, the kind of coarse scale predictions that would come out of our models and then use models like a stock assessment model that are much more finely tuned to the specific biology of a specific animal, but then say, well, but we also know that there's going to be this ecosystem effect out there and that might change the way that the, the, the actual forecast from the single species model is drawn up. Hi. Um, two questions. One, it seems like a lot of data is being generated both in Alaska and our Puget Sound. Is there an organized regional sort of monitoring program that assesses the health of both fisheries and two also, are there other like collaborative like state agencies and NOAA and maybe other agencies that are doing this monitoring perhaps that get together and give input on assessments as well? So. Well, in Puget Sound, there is most of the monitoring that's done in Puget Sound is done by the state of Washington uh, agencies and they certainly are working uh, collaborative, co collaboratively with one another. Uh, one of the constraints, I guess, on that is that certain agencies have, um, they have to sample for things like water quality or shellfish toxin levels or things at a much finer level uh, and, and than, say, someone who is going out counting bird abundance or, or, uh, or counting fish, and the budgets for fish survey work can be swallowed up pretty quickly by just looking at the fish in one sub-basin of Puget Sound and you don't even get to the other ones in that year. So even though they're working together, the scale of sampling tends to be quite different and that's been, that's been a real handicap for getting monitoring data from Puget Sound in all the areas uh, at a scale that w we would really like to see, except for some of the most valuable species like salmon, herring, and then some of those shellfish uh, questions. Yeah, and I think just briefly in Alaska, there, there's a lot of collaboration in the sort of fisheries context between the state and the federal government and the International Halibut Commission and a few other interests in the fisheries. Um, there's also collaboration that's voluntary between agencies and sort of marine planning where, say, minerals management or whatever they're called now gets together with NOAA and says, hey, we're doing this thing up here or you know, it, it's not formal, but there is communication. So if that answers your question, I think in the fisheries context, we're pretty coordinated, I think. Yeah. Um, how do you choose the boundaries of the Alaska fisheries ecosystem? That's a really good question. So some of them are chosen for us by basically statute. And so when we go out 200 nautical miles, that's Congress that says we need to look that far out. But when we look at the ecosystem, we really only look at the continental shelves, so that's the shallow bits up here. So that's where most of the action is right there. And the, the lines between the systems, some of them are sort of scientifically drawn. There's clear boundaries between one set of animals and another for multiple types of animals. And for others, like the Arctic, you know, there's an obvious boundary right there. And, and so it's part statute and part ecosystem characteristic, I think. I guess kind of building on, on that question, um, how, I mean, given that you're working in an ecosystem that has species that, you know, migrate across the oceans and up and down the coastlines, um, sort of what's the, how do you, how do you judge the, the value in effect uh, efficacy of the model, given that you can't really get a sense for, like, say if the orca population s squeezes south or squeezes east out of your sampling zone? 
Well, that that's that is that's a that's a terrific question that every one of us deals with on a constant basis with these models. Uh, it it goes back to uh, one of the answers we gave earlier, which is why we take any prediction that we make with these models with a grain of salt. Uh, and it also uh, uh, certainly speaks to the fact that we are constantly updating these models with new and improved data uh, as we get it. And part of that is rather than saying that the, let's say the number of, of animals in the system is this. We would say because of the same issue that you just imply, the number of animals of species X in the system is between this and this. Uh, and we actually sometimes have to use uh, what we call forcing functions, uh, which is basically using kind of the invisible hand to push the biomass of a particular animal up or down because we know that in some years they are more abundant than they are in others. Uh, and and it's, those, it's exactly those kinds of, uh, of migratory or transitory species uh, that uh, make the definition of an ecosystem such a, a fuzzy one. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Chris probably has more problems with that than we do in Alaska just because of the sheer scale of the system. Um, some things migrate throughout Alaska, but we've got models to cover each area. So we hope that we're covering them all, all of them at some point, but you lose the detail. And so there's trade-offs there. So I have a question about the recent, um, it has to do with the recent news of the whale that would, came in contact with the boat, do y'all do any like research on how boatings and how many whales come in contact or get hurt by boats every year in the Puget Sound area? Are we doing work on that? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, the NOAA Fisheries, uh, part of our Seattle facilities is the National Marine Mammal Laboratory, which is actually in the same facility where Sarah works. And that includes a marine mammal uh, stranding network uh, but that sounds like it's just ones that wash up on beaches. But they, they monitor and record as much information as they can about any marine mammal that is, uh, that, that is reported as having, having had any kind of interaction with, with, uh, with a vessel or with getting tangled in fishing gear or found with a bullet wound or anything like that uh, gets reported to the extent possible. And we can certainly include that kind of impact uh, in these models. It gets a little more difficult when the, the impacts on marine mammals are uh, what we would say sublethal, where you're not killing them, but let's say you're affecting their behavior because they're avoiding areas where there's a lot of boat traffic. That's much harder to do, but we try to keep uh, account of any human-related mortality on a marine mammal uh, that we think is gonna represent an important part of the model, uh, and a, you know, a, a major source of, of mortality, let's say. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed your talk. I have two questions. Um, the first one, you mentioned that there are 800 catches that are analyzed and assessed, um, and that someone, someone asked earlier what happens to those catches, and you said for various reasons we can't eat them, so they go back over. I just want to clarify that those, they're dead. Yeah, so, that, so the 800, let me, let me clarify even more what that is. So I showed you an individual catch on the trawl survey, and so in a typical Gulf of Alaska survey, which covers that whole big area down there, we would have approximately 800 of those spread out over 300,000 square kilometers. So it's actually a fairly small sample of that area. But yeah, and usually tip, that was a fairly big catch for the survey. Some of them are less than that. But yeah, we, we will put it overboard with minimal injury, but some scientific research causes great injury, like taking out the ear stones so you can age the fish. That's lethal. Um, you know, cutting them open to sex them. That's lethal. So we do that for a subsample of things, but especially large things that we don't need information from, we do try to get them over as fast as we can. A lot of it will not make it, though. Some do survive. It's possible. Um, I think especially things like skates, if we're not sampling them, they're pretty tough. Octopus tend to do pretty well. They're crawling off the table before we can weigh them. Um, <laughs> there's, there's a few things that I think do pretty well, and, but trawling is kind of tough on a lot of animals, especially Pollock. They're not going to make it. So. And my second question. I was very intrigued you used the word story a couple of times mm -hmm. in reference to your new report. Mm -hmm. and particularly, you said it, this year you tried made a special effort to um, tell the story about what's happening. 
And so I just wondered if you, um, it, that suggests to me that you ha somehow have come to think that imposing a narrative structure on scientific mm -hmm. data may help in terms of articulating hypotheses or interpretation of data um, or communicating. And I just wondered where that idea came from and if you mm. could talk a little bit about the interface of narrative structure mm. and scientific data and how that's useful. That's, that is, as Chris said, a really spectacular yeah, question. Yeah, I, I have goosebumps. Uh, <laughs> if that's not too nerdy to admit, I have yeah. goosebumps right now. That's great. Yeah, yeah. I, and I, you know, I can't take credit for unconsciously using the word story, but we were asked to synthesize the information and to provide basically a context for a whole bunch of, you know, lines on a graph to, to tell people what is going on in the system. And I think trying to communicate it in the form of there's this and it leads to this and it leads to this and it affects this and this is, is a more accessible way of doing it. And that is one of our big goals in talking with something like the North Pacific Fishery Management Council or, or any of our other clients basically, which is all public, that's who we're here to serve, is, is how do we get this science to be understood and how do we make it relevant I mean, yeah, we measured copepods in the Bering Sea. <laughs> now you're asleep, right? So if we, but if we tell you, look, they were doing this with the ice and the pollock eat them and, and you know, the fur seals might like that eventually, but we don't know. <laughs> it's, it's maybe not a satisfying, happy ending, but yeah, we are trying to get there, especially for these documents for, for management consumption. They have to have the science, but they have to make it relevant. So I don't know, do you want to add? To yeah, that? I, oh, well, I would just add, I mean, you, you, you think about a, a, a plot like either one of these, and you could, you could assume that we are very capable of producing just reams and reams of reports where each one of these gets converted into a line, mm -hmm. like one of those squiggle plots I showed before, and we would we would bore people to the point that they never, they wish we'd never been born before, but <laughs> but th that exactly that kind of narrative structure, especially when we're dealing with with model output that's got a, an, an incredible amount of uncertainty to it, it helps us convey information to the extent uh, you know scientists are notoriously bad at communicating, and I hope we're breaking I hope we're breaking that that mold a little bit, but uh, to the extent that we can convey information in terms that people understand and that they can empathize with us that we're not any, you know, we're not 1,000% sure about this this either. Well, there's a lot of uncertainty tied up in it. And, and the, the, a narrative structure, I think, supports that much more. And especially when we're talking not just with managers but with stakeholders who have their own stories to tell about the exact same condition. It's a, it's a really happy uh, kind of common ground that we can find uh, because, I mean, most, most fishermen out there know way more about any of this stuff than I ever will, but we can communicate at a level like that, and, uh, and the trust that's garnered from that uh, is really valuable. Um, I worked on research vessels on and off for a couple of decades, and I have a really great appreciation for just how hard your job is and how hard it is to understand what's going on in the oceans. And so I wonder if it's even possible for you guys to estimate, say, on a scale of 1 to 10 or something, where you stand with respect to how close you are to having enough data to really effectively manage our resources. Um, I know there's a difference between trying your best and really having adequate data and whatever it takes. So, and I don't know if it's even possible to estimate that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a tough one. Um, because depending on who you talk to in, say, the fishery sciences, a, a lot of the people that have dealt with the, the more traditional means of analyzing fisheries data and making stock assessments and predictions would say that we actually do a pretty good job. Uh, you know, it's it's a, a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of agencies and groups out there say that fisheries are in decline worldwide. A lot of fisheries around the world are in decline. That's indisputable. Uh, but a lot of them that have declined are recovering. A lot of them that. Uh, we fish have never gone below a level that they were really that jeopardized. So it's it's really depends. You know, what people like that would su would say that fisheries management actually is pretty successful. But then on the other hand, 
you know, we, we still have all these other species that we know very little about. We have, you know, since we know little about them already, we certainly don't know how fishing affects them. Uh, and frankly, we look out and we see a big flat blue thing that's got all this stuff happening underneath it. And as Sarah pointed out, we can't even sample everywhere. We can only sample in places where we don't think our gear is going to damage the bottom. So uh, I, on a scale of 1 to 10, uh, I think I, I, don't, I don't have a... I don't really know where I would go there. Um, I, I, think, I think I would probably s assume somewhere below five, but heading in the right direction, I just don't know how fast I'm going. <laughs> I, I, that's about as wishy-washy. Yeah. I, th I think I would agree with what Chris just said, that in particular in Alaska, the management system itself is pretty well set up for what it's designed for, which is managing individual target species quotas and we know pretty well what's caught which is a big problem other places and we have an effective system for stopping the catch when it hits the limit no matter what fishery is catching it and so that that management system i think is pretty effective but the questions come in like chris said in, is in the things that we aren't looking at is that going to cause us a surprise and i think that's where we're coming from is can we provide additional information so that you know there aren't any surprises and it stays sustainable and we make sure that this is really what we want to be doing um question for uh, you, Sarah, uh, with those trawling surveys that you had, um, after that, uh, there's the peer, re peer review process. Um, are there other agencies that go out there and try and duplicate your results? And if there are, what sort of stuff is done to prevent conflict of interests and what sort of consideration is given to negative findings? Wow, that's a lot of questions all in one. I'll try to answer all of them, but if I don't, follow up. So. Um, in terms of surveys and scientific assessments, there are multiple agencies doing them. Um, we tend to come together in the same review process, so there's this thing called plan team that we all participate in, and some of them are federal scientists doing the assessments, and some of them are state scientists, and there's people from the Halibut Commission and a few other places there. And some of them have data sets other than ours, that they've done their own surveys in you know smaller scale regions like Southeast Alaska or Puget Sound. And the state will do surveys too. So in some sense, we look at all of those surveys and we, we ask whether, you know, are they kind of going the same direction? Can they validate each other to some extent? I wouldn't call it replication. They're, they're really different, but we can look at the trends across them and just get a feel for if, if one of them's telling something really different, we would look at it more closely. Um, okay, and I'm forgetting the next part I knew I would. The conflict of interest. So, um, I'm not exactly sure what the question means, but there is, so the way fishery management is set up in the US, it, some people have said that it's a conflict of interest because the fishery management councils are usually re industry, fishing industry representatives on the decision making body, the council itself. That's, it, they're, they're from multiple different fisheries and there's also state and federal representatives on there and there's different parts of the review process that represent different interests. So there's more of a science government section of it. There's more of a industry and environmental group and other stakeholder interest group. And so conflict of interest may not be the right term, but multiple interests are definitely involved and, and they have trade-offs between them. <laughs> so, and, and I think, for the most part, at least in Alaska, from what I've observed, it, there appear to be enough checks and balances that it's not like one group wins all the time and they always get their way. There's definitely some unevenness and depending on who you talk to, you know, some people feel that parts of the fishery are treated differently than other parts of the fishery because of who's in power and et cetera. And I think that's gonna be like that in just about any stakeholder management process, but I'm not sure I have a whole lot more insight beyond that because I'm sort of on the science end of the review, so. We have time for two more questions. Yeah, I had a question on the Puget Sound fisheries, and I mean, anecdotally, as a sport fisher person, um, over my lifetime, it seems like it's drastically decreased. I'm just wondering um, the sustainability of the fishery, both from a sports perspective and also commercial. Uh, which species do you fish for? Salmon. Okay. Well, and crab. Salmon and crab. Uh, well, 
Uh, most of my most of my familiarity actually is with uh, the ground fish, the rockfish, and the the cod and the flatfish. Um, and w I think we do know that harvest levels. Um, I'm not sure if we know enough to know if it was recreational or, or commercial, but I think a lot of the evidence would be commercial. That commercial levels of harvest of some of those ground fish was definitely not sustainable, uh, and we still have some ground fish that uh, that we need to. Well, in fact, rockfish, uh, cod, walleye pollock, and hake I think are all protected in Puget Sound uh, almost throughout the entire. Uh, uh, water body now uh, with salmon I guess it's it's kind of depends on which species you're you're talking about I assume are, are you thinking of Chinook and steelhead and things like that yeah um, I don't really know uh, uh, there are a lot of people at our center that know quite a bit more about salmon than I do I, I definitely have a ground fish background um, so I think at the risk of of telling you something that's that's incorrect, I think I'm going to ask if you want to talk about it afterward, so I can put you in touch with people that know way more about it than I do. I'm sorry to be a a, a waffler. I was accused of waffling in the Seattle Times on ratfish, and I thought that was great. I like waffles. <laughs> Hi. Um, the media reports a lot about uh, ice melt. In, in from glaciers and, and just Greenland and Alaska. And I was wondering if that affects salinity in, in the Gulf of Alaska and the areas, and if that matters to ecosystems. Um, in the Gulf of Alaska, there's a really clear signal of an annual ice melt that comes streaming out uh, from, point to it on the map, comes straight out of Cook Inlet here, and you can see this big blast of fresh water come right out there into the open gulf. And that's a seasonal event, and the ecosystem is adapted to it. Um, I am not a physical oceanographer or a meteorologist, but there are people tracking the glaciers in Alaska and might be able to, I could find out and put you in touch with people who may know more about whether that's changing over time. Um, but there's, there's clearly a salinity signal in the gulf every year, yeah. 